Up until this point, we've been talking about binary distillation, where we're thinking about only two components. Uh, in practical cases of, of interest, usually we're going to have a lot more components than just two, and we can have many uh, components uh, being presented to a distillation column. So we need to broaden our discussion to consider situations where we do have multi-component distillation taking place. Now, today we're going to consider a four-component distillation situation. We're going to use the same hardware in the column that we would use for binary distillation, so things like a total condenser here in this case, partial reboiler, a single feed. Uh, so our, our specifics of, of the column itself don't really change. But one of the things that is going to change is that we need to specify a lot more about the problem in order to, to make progress. Uh, the book talks about how uh, we have a number of components plus six degrees of freedom that we have to specify. That's uh, assuming that the column is running uh, isobarically and uh, adiabatically. Um, and so for this particular problem, we're looking at, at essentially 10 degrees of freedom uh, that, that need to be specified in order to be able uh, to move forward. And so uh, we can go through and think about what those might be. We're, we're used to seeing situations where we have um, aspects of the feed uh, that are going to be uh, specified as our degrees of freedom, right? So we have a, a feed flow rate, and then we're going to have three degrees of freedom satisfied by just specifying three of the four components, right? We can calculate then the, the fourth component via material balance that doesn't count as a degree of freedom, uh, but it is something we know we can specify. We're always going to specify typically uh, n minus one of the number of components that we have in our system. Uh, out of that 10 degrees of freedom, the pressure is being considered to be constant. So in this uh, particular way that, that the book talks about this degree of freedom analysis, uh, that doesn't uh, factor into our 10 that we're looking for. Uh, but we are specifying things like the reflux ratio is a degree of freedom. Uh, the fact that we're going to use the optimum feed plate and the fact that both the reflux and the feed uh, are going to also be uh, saturated liquids. And so we've got eight degrees of freedom. Um, you know, we could broaden things here. The book discusses it a little bit. We could broaden things to say the pressure in the column uh, are degrees of freedom and change that number from 10 to 12. Uh, but we'll stick with the, the book's uh, 10 degrees of freedom here, recognizing uh, that the isobaric uh, pressure that the column is operating at and the fact that the column can be taken as adiabatic uh, is, is taken as a given here. All right, so, so we've got eight of our 10 degrees of freedom. Um, and so the other two degrees of freedom are going to allow us to specify the separation, right? You'll notice here we don't have any information about uh, distillate or bottoms product compositions or, or anything really pertaining to what kind of separation we're actually looking to do. Now, one of the problems that we're going to run into uh, with multi-component distillation is it doesn't work to just come in and specify uh, two of the distillate compositions, for example, or, or one distillate composition and one bottoms composition, because that doesn't fully specify uh, the stream uh, that we're working with. And so the way that, that we're going to uh, go about doing this is to use this idea of fractional recoveries. Um, and so a fractional recovery is going to be really useful to us in multi-component distillation. It's going to tell us about the amount of that particular component that is recovered in either the distillate or the bottoms divided by the total amount of that that was fed to the column. Right? And so you see here for uh, the fractional recovery of component I in the distillate uh, that the numerator is, is D, the flow rate. Uh, of the distillate multiplied by uh, the mole fraction or the composition of component I in the distillate. And that's divided by uh, the feed flow rate times the feed composition of component I, right? So amount of I in the distillate relative to amount of I in the feed. In other words, if everything, uh, if, if all of component I leaves through the distillate, then its fractional recovery is one or 100%. Uh, if only 80%, for example, leaves in the distillate, uh, then we would have a situation where the fractional recovery of component I in the distillate would be 0.8, and the fractional recovery 
of component i in the bottoms would be 0.2 uh, because ultimately all of the component i that comes into the column has to leave out one of the two uh, exit streams uh, in the absence of any sort of reaction or things like that in the column. Um, and so we have this situation where uh, the, the fractional recoveries in, in the streams that are leaving the column uh, have to sum to unity for a particular component uh, to make sure that everything that's coming into the column is also uh, leaving the column. And so uh, we're going to use fractional recoveries in multi-component distillation and we'll see how we factor those into uh, the external balances that we're going to do around the column. Um, but before we, we uh, get to that point, we need to talk a little bit about how we uh, talk about components in multi-component distillation. All right, so in binary distillation, we had this idea that we had a more volatile component and a less volatile component, and it was pretty easy to figure out which was which, right? We could look at the saturation vapor pressures or the boiling points, uh, so on and so forth, and, and we could figure out uh, which component was more volatile. In the multi-component distillation case, uh, we just have more components, and so uh, we need a, a way of, of discussing uh, or, or labeling the different components relative to the process goal for the separation we're looking uh, to accomplish. And so what we're going to do to do this is talk about key and non-key components. Um, so basically what we're going to do is we're going to define the split uh, between two key components. So in our uh, example here, uh, thinking about a four component distillation uh, here, didn't explicitly mention it, but here we're talking about this four, these four components being uh, propane or C3, butane or C4, uh, pentane or C5, and hexane or C6. Those are our four components we're thinking about in this example. So we know that the order of volatility uh, decreases as the chain length of these alkanes increases. Right, so we know that C3 or propane is the most volatile and then as we add more uh, methylene groups onto the alkane chain right the volatility decreases so we know that the propane is going to tend toward the top of the column and hexane is going to tend toward the bottom of the column um, but we need to figure out where we actually want to make the split and one of the key things that we'll talk about with distillation columns is that we have to pick as the engineer where we're going to make the split. In a single column, we only get to make the split at one point, right? And so we have to figure out how to make that, that split. And so what's, what's useful is to come in in this way um, and, and set up your components in uh, this way where volatility is either increasing or decreasing. I think it works well to put the um, most volatile component at the top because that's where it's going to tend to go uh, in the column. But if we think about this right, we could come in and say we have our, our four components for our system. And we get to pick where we want to make the separation. Maybe we want to separate between butane uh, and pentane, for example, and we could come in uh, and decide that we want to want to make our split there. At the same time, we could come in uh, and say that we want to make our split at the C3, C4 level. And so we want to try to really purify propane out the top of the column, and then we'll take uh, all three heavier hydrocarbons out the bottom of the column. We could do the same thing between C5 and C6, right, if uh, purifying hexane was more important to us. Now, if we want to separate all four of these, right, we're going to need a situation where we're going to need multiple columns, right? We, we've got three different splits here. We can only do one split per column. Uh, so we would need multiple columns in series to separate all four of these. Uh, for the purpose of this example, we're just going to consider doing one of those splits, uh, and we'll think about a situation where we're going to split between C4 and C5. So this, in this particular case, we're going to send the majority of the C3 and C4 out the top of the column, and the C5 and C6 components uh, are going to go out the bottoms, and then we might need two more columns if we wanted to, to fully separate out all four. Uh, but for this example, this is where we're going to make our split. And the way that we're going to do this um, is that we're going to call our key components uh, the components on either side of this split. So in this case, C4 
becomes our light key component. And C5 becomes our heavy key component. All right, so C4 is the light key because it's on the more volatile side of the split. C5 is the heavy key because it's on uh, the less volatile side of the split. And the key components tell us what's on either side of the split that we're gonna decide to make. Uh, then we could further label non-key components. So C3 would be a light non-key. And C6 would be a heavy non-key. And sometimes we call these HNK, LNK, and for the key components, LK and HK. All right, so any components that are lighter or more volatile than the light key component are LNK components. Uh, and any components that are heavier or less volatile than the heavy key uh, become heavy non-key components. And we can have as many non-key components as we want, uh, but we're only going to have one light key and one heavy key in the separation. Uh, if we have a, a component for some reason that's in between the key components, uh, sort of a special case situation, this is what we call a, a sandwich component, uh, but we're not going to deal with that uh, too, too much right here, right now. Right now we're focused on the, the key and non-key components. Um, and so generally the way we're going to identify the key and non-key components uh, is by specifying the fractional recovery uh, of those particular components. And so for example, we could come in for this example we're working on and say that we're going to specify the fractional recovery of C4 in the distillate. And we might say we want to recover, now let's just say 99.4%. Uh, and then we could specify the fractional recovery of C5 in the bottoms. And maybe we'll say that we want to recover 99.7% uh, uh, of the pentane in the bottom stream. And so specifying uh, the fractional recovery defines these as the LK and the HK. Right, because essentially this is how we're, we're specifying the separation. We're, we're targeting a recovery of 99.4% of butane in the distillate product and 99.7% of pentane uh, in the bottoms product. And if we can go through uh, and specify the separation in this way, uh, this then gives us the remaining two degrees of freedom. And now our example uh, that we started on the previous slide uh, has all 10 degrees of freedom, and we can move forward and, and be guaranteed that there's a solution to the balances related to this problem. And, and in class, we'll work through the external balances and see a little bit more about how we make uh, progress on these multi-component distillation problems. Uh, but for right now, we want to be getting used to this idea of the degree of freedom analysis and the fact that we're going to be using uh, key and non-key components to talk about uh, the different compounds in the system. And it's gonna be really important that we know how to define uh, the light and heavy key components using fractional recoveries because that's the kind of nomenclature uh, that we're gonna be working with as we continue to talk about multi-component distillation.